Yes, thanks everyone for the for the um, opportunity to, to join this this extended conference. Um, okay, uh, cyber crimes and online criminal markets. The first point to make is it's a massive growth area, as the online and digital technologies are transforming. So so is organised crime, and it's a, it's it's going to carry on growing. That was one of the uh, the points that was made very early on in our sessions. I'm going to be drawing on the six presentations and the snapshot talks. Um, I'm not going to summarise them. I'm going to go straight to the answers, kind of. But can I make it absolutely clear that it, it was hard to summarise them and they were, they were absolutely fabulous. Um, I did spend most of yesterday, actually, Sir Craig, trying to work out how PowerPoint would work. And I've now decided that I'm not going to be the only academic who uses PowerPoint. So... I can't tell you how brave I I'm feeling. Um, I love this approach that let's sort out the problem and on day two we'll sort out the answers. And we've divide, we divided or I've decided to divide our discussion on, on the, the problem into two blocks. The first is administrative problems, administrative type issues. And the second is specific crime issues. And I'll use the same two blocks for the for the, um, the answers, if you like, the, for the solutions, the suggested solutions. So identifying the administrative problems, guess what the first one is? Data accuracy and access. Yeah, <laughs> everybody, everybody recognises it. The reason I've differentiated between administrative issues and specific crime issues is because I, I thought the administrative issues would be easy to solve. They would be within our gift. So what on earth is going wrong with data accuracy and access if we can't even get that right? Somebody needs to do something about it. And I'm going to refer to somebody quite a bit in this talk because this somebody's got a lot to answer for. The second point was that different agencies have very different cultures. I mean, that goes without saying, but one of our speakers made the point that it's much easier to get data in the United States than it is in the UK. And you have to ask, well, that's, that's interesting. Why is that? Has it got something to do with the GDPR and they haven't got that problem and we have? But it should be, somebody should sort it out again. Um, another point was made that um, individual crime problems are diverse and so are the solutions. And that particular speaker was looking for... Um, some sort of coordination, some prioritization of which ones are more important than which. And when it comes to solutions, how do we how do we work together? My fourth point on administrative issues was generally this lack of awareness of crime of cybercrime problems, particularly at the individual level. It's obvious, you know, old ladies are being defrauded on the internet regularly, and old gentlemen as well, if I'm you know, we're all vulnerable. Um, but particularly at board level. So organisation, and that's where the big money is for the cyber criminals. Um, ransomware was, was mentioned particularly. Next, it was the complete uselessness, basically, of the traditional criminal justice approach. Um, it's ineffective, especially when offenders are operating overseas with impunity. Um, Russia was mentioned, but we, we, we'll all have our favourite places that we think should deal with this. Um, next, it was noted that these cyber criminals are really entrepreneurial. They can move fast, whereas we who are trying to tackle the problems of cyber crime are rule-based and constrained. We have our hands tied behind our backs. Sometimes we've tied our hands behind our backs ourselves. So that kind of needs to be a bit unpicked and and it needs to be as this point made by Mike amongst others that we need to be able to move faster um, and respond more quickly and finally it was noted that there are huge rewards um, in cybercrime and it's causing skilled potential actors to choose cybercrime as a career I mean my nightmare is I ask my grandson what he wants to be when he grows up and he says a cyber criminal because that's where the money is these days wouldn't that be dreadful 
Right. They're the administrative issues, which of course are easy to solve. So we'll move on to the specific crime issues now, which are really rather more challenging. And the first one was made, the first point I want to make was, was made by Eric, and I thought it was a, an amazing point because I hadn't thought of it on anything I haven't thought of. I think, oh, that's amazing. Anyway, his point was that cyber criminals also need secure systems. And there's a vast underground economy catering for large numbers of regular offenders and cyber criminals with specialised security products and services. And they're, they're vulnerable. We could hack, we, someone, this someone person, could hack them, could disrupt them, could really wreck their systems. I mean, maybe this is going on, but maybe it could actually be, be used as a far more, in a more strategic way. I've only got three three issues on the specific crimes. The second is to what extent do cyber crimes and cyber criminals differ from what you might call regular offenders and um, regular offences? And four really specific points were raised under this heading. The first one was that their criminal careers are very different. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, burglars, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a, a 75 year old, you're going to struggle climbing a, a drain pipe or over a wall, but it won't stop you from fiddling around on the internet. So that your career can be longer, it, it will start earlier and so on. Displacement is also apparently far more common in cyberspace. Someone was saying it's almost not worth blocking this because within a month they've moved on to the next thing. And that displacement isn't so common in what you might call regular crime. The third one was that offenders seem to cooperate with each other much more in cyberspace than they do in the real world. And that's a thing to do with space. Um, if you're in the drugs selling drugs on street corners in Baltimore or somewhere. You're fighting for turf and it's a finite space, whereas the internet is not like that. And so offenders can help each other and, and collaborate more. And finally, they're, they, they seem to be getting more professional and more ruthless, um, as opposed to, say, what you might call regular criminals. And the final point about... Um, on the specific crime issues was what specifically can be done these these issues were raised by our speakers about ransomware which is make people you know carrying out ransomware um attacks can make huge amounts of money the second one was human trafficking and sexual exploitation which we've heard about from one of the other groups and the third one was interesting the illegal illegal goods being sold on legitimate websites um, and the illegal goods would be things like protected plants or species or, or ivory or what have you. And interestingly, the offenders need to access legitimate buyers, if you like. Um, it's not like they're selling drugs on the dark web. It's, it's, an op it's open and can be seen. But eBay, to take an example, we were told, only takes down between 2 and 7% of ivory sales. Now that's disgraceful and it, sh it shouldn't happen. Someone needs to do something. Moving to day two and our um, undermining attempts, the administrative issues. The first one, in common with other groups, we need more collaboration across the piece. Industry, public and private sectors, we need to improve data accuracy, access and use a common language for law enforcement, industry and academe. We need to set some clear priorities for action and co-ownership of problems. And so all of this is basically about collaboration. Invest in legal organization and technical harmonization. Um, I'm sure that's right. We, we need to collaborate. And we've known this from ordinary crime attempts to deal with ordinary partnerships were very bogus. You remember Sigrid very well. Let's all have a partnership. But there's a good reason for saying that, because often the, the, the ways of controlling crime are in somebody else's gift. Um, the option was raised to consider the use of data science as a means of automating and scaling interventions so we can roll things out on a grander scale. Interestingly, the good news was that scenario-based training for corporate leadership seemed to be working well. So if you do explain to them what the problems are and use scenarios to talk them through it, they can see their vulnerabilities and are more likely to do something. The most telling, I think, um, 
point in relation to administrative issues was calling for a paradigm shift in the way law enforcement agencies ap approach cybercrime. And it, it, it was a point made in earlier sessions as well, including the last one that, and you've said yourself, we need training that police are wrong footed completely in relation to cybercrime. Um, so there's a huge amount of work there. And then turning to specific crime issues on data and what we can do about that, determine the vital security infrastructure for specific cyber crimes and attack it. And that's easy to say, but I'm sure hackers could do that. The trouble with using hackers, you know, ethical hackers, I think, is that the police aren't allowed to employ them, as I understand it, if they've got a criminal record. And uh, presumably the best hackers don't have a criminal record because they don't get caught. Well, there are some pretty good hackers around who've got, I mean, I, we met one um, following a home office conference a few years ago. His, his offence as a hacker had been to hack into BT systems just to check that BT weren't trying to scam him on a, on a charity donation and BT caught him. So we ended up with a conviction. That meant he couldn't help the National Crime Agency, for example. So let's take a few more risks and employ a few more hackers. Um, develop leverage to increase the rate at which legitimate platforms take down illegitimate operations. Mike Barton said somebody needs to do something about this and, and it is absolutely right. Um, developing leverage is really important. And the reason car crime in the UK has dropped by nearly eight, over 80% in the last 30 years is because they will leave it into action by the Home Office producing a car theft index. That's the kind of thing they need to do. And to pick Max's point up, they need to do something about remote locking now, but even so. The next penultimate point is to re reward computer users for identifying websites selling illegal products. And I, I want to draw an analogy here with Neighbourhood Watch. It's like having, let's have a neighborhood watch in the cyberspace where ordinary citizens have a way of reporting illegitimate, whatever it is that's in, in you know, not the dark web, we don't, it, it's legitimate sales or leg, legitimate sellers, but nothing's happening. And my final point is that we know a great deal about regular crime and criminals, but far less about the extent to which those lessons we've learned there transfer into the virtual world. So I'm an academic. Obviously, we need to fund more research and develop our knowledge in this area. But I think specifically, and what we've learned from crime prevention generally is, we need to develop ways of increasing the perceived risk, the offender's perceived risk to offending, increase the effort it takes for them to do those offences and reduce the rewards associated with offending. And then um, we'd be taking the lessons that we've hard, I mean, hard earned into cybercrime and applying them there.